Well, Merry Christmas again. Um, who here still has a few Christmas movies to watch before Christmas? Yeah. You got your list, like the ones that you've got to see, the ones that are, if you have time, you'll get around to them. Is that just just me? Um, man, I, I, I love Christmas time. I, uh, I grew up in a house that just um, went all out every Christmas. Um, and so it, I, I got it honest, and um, we are pretty, like, intense with our Christmas in our house. We are doing, like, three or four different Advent things with the kids right now. Um, my wife, Tiffany, she's back there uh, in the kids today. Um, she's, like, I mean, I, I think she's as excited as the kids are, uh, if not more, um, about Christmas. So... Anyways, we, we just absolutely do it big and, um, and, uh, and have a good time with it. Um, this morning, we're going to talk about uh, joy in the mundane. Um, the definition of mundane is humdrum, dull, boring, unexciting, regular, or routine. Um, if you think about it, a lot of life is uh, mundane. A lot of life is sort of routine and unexciting. And, you know, honestly, some of our Christmases can be a little mundane. A lot of times we, we build up the excitement and then it comes and goes without, um, without a whole lot of real joy for us. Um, if you think about a typical week in your life, um, you know, maybe you wake up, go to work, um, go through your day, come home, eat dinner, check Instagram or Facebook, uh, or, or don't, because you've been checking it all day at work, so you're already in the loop. Um, you know, watch a, a show on Netflix or a movie, go to bed, get up, repeat. Um, and so a lot of times we can sort of get in these cycles where life just feels really mundane. It feels really unexciting, and we try to build up that next weekend getaway or that next vacation or that next holiday or whatever it is so that we have something to look forward to. Um, but if so much of life is mundane, if so much of it is just regular and routine and unexciting, then what it wouldn't it be great if we could learn how to really have joy in those unexciting days and those unexciting weeks? Wouldn't that be wonderful? Um, let's take another look at this account of the birth of Jesus Christ. This is the account of the birth of the Savior of the world, by the way, um, the one that had been prophesied for thousands of years that he would come. And here is what we read. We're going to read it one more time. Luke 2, 1 through 7. In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for him in the inn. Wait a second. I must have read that wrong. This cannot possibly be the story of the one who flung the stars into space becoming a man. It's a story about a, a census, a couple going on a road trip from tiny town of Nazareth, Nazareth to the tiny city of Bethlehem, um, a baby being born and wrapped in strips of cloth laid in a feeding trough for animals because the hotel in Bethlehem was full. Uh, how could this possibly be the story of the Creator God coming to earth and becoming 
a man. It's just too plain. And maybe we have in our minds this picture that we've seen in some nativity scenes where there's an angel floating above them, you know, and there's a light shining down from heaven right on the manger. But we we added those parts. See, actually, um, in the Bible, what we just read is what it was. It was just it was just Mary and Joseph and the baby being born, and they wrap the baby up and they put him in this manger. And you know, to be sure, there's a an incredible thing that happens out in the fields with the shepherds that are tending their flocks, and angels appear to them. But I'm talking about right here, where Mary and Joseph are, where Jesus is born. It's just like another night. There's like, you know, there's sheep walking around and and goats and whatever else, oxen. And uh, yet, this was the most joyful moment in all of history up to this point. Now think about that. How much more mundane can you get? And yet, it's the most joyful moment in all of history up to this point. After this, Matthew tells us that Mary and Joseph go back to their hometown of Nazareth. Um, Aside from a short side trip to Egypt while Jesus is a toddler, um, This town of Nazareth is where Jesus grows up for 30 years. And uh, it's what you would call podunk, Nazareth. It's um, a very small, small town. It's the kind of place that most people don't even know exists. That's why in, in Scripture the authors always make sure to explain where it is. Um, it's, if people did know where it was, they didn't like it. In fact, in John 1, uh, 45 and 46, we have this, where um, Philip, a brand new disciple of Jesus, goes to find Nathaniel and to, and to challenge Nathaniel to come and meet Jesus. And it says, um, Philip says to Nathaniel, we found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. He, he's saying, we found the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth the son of Joseph. And Nathanael says to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, Come and see. And so Nathanael is expressing the typical sentiment for, a, for an Israelite in his day. This is how they thought of Nazareth. Really? Like, Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? That's how they thought of this place, and this is where Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah, the Promised One, grows up. It's where he spends the first thirty years of his life in obscurity. Back in those days, if you Googled mundane, Nazareth would have popped up. <laughs> and yet, this is the town that the Savior of the world comes out of. So, so here's my point. Nathaniel asked the question, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And God's answer to that question is yes, the best thing in all the world. This is how God works. God loves to bring his best out of the mundane, out of the ordinary, out of the things you wouldn't notice, the people you wouldn't notice, the days you wouldn't think twice about. That's where God loves to work. That's where he loves to bring his best. And so we can and should learn to have joy in the mundane stuff of life. When you find yourself asking the question, can anything good come out of this project at work? Can anything good come out of this load of laundry? Can anything good come out of washing the sink full of dishes? Can anything good come out of 
this day alone with my kids driving me nuts? I speak from experience. Can anything good come out of this week, this marriage? The answer is yes. Because God loves to produce his best in the places we least expect. This morning, I want to encourage you with three truths to remember that will be a tremendous help for you um, as you seek to have joy in the mundane. Hopefully you got a little sheet um, of paper with notes that you can fill in um, when you came in. If not, I apologize. I don't know what to do for you. <laughs> but uh, no, we got a few extras here. Tim's passing around. Um, so the first truth that I want to encourage you with this morning that will help you to have joy in the mundane is life isn't about me. Life isn't about me. Contrary to popular belief, this life isn't about you or me. That means that Christmas isn't about me, my job isn't about me, my kids are not about me, my marriage is not about me. Colossians 1.16 says, For by Jesus all things were created. All things were created through Him and for Him. Did you hear that? All things were created for Jesus. All things were created through Jesus. So life, then, isn't about me. And what I'm about to show you is that that's good news. We think we, think we want it to be about us and that that would be better, but here's what you find. Those that have made life all about themselves are the most miserable people on the planet. Life isn't about me. That means it's bigger than me and my mundane day and my mundane week. Here's what it says in Psalm 139, 13 and 16. For you formed me in my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. Man. He decided it all and he didn't even ask our opinion. We were made by him and for him. And therefore life is not about me. See, when we begin, even if it's ever so slowly and subtly, to believe that life is about me, then here's what happens. We become very short-sighted. We fail to realize that there is much more going on in the story than what's going on in the room I occupy. You see, when life's about me, then my world is only as big as what I can see. And, and that's just sad. And that will lead us down a path of despair. But when I remember that life isn't about me, oh man, I can recognize that God is doing a million things in just the city I live in. He's doing a billion things all over the planet that are being woven together into an incredible and beautiful story. I'm just one tiny little piece of it. And you see what happens is I can start to lift my eyes from my little existence, from my little tasks, up to a massive, all-powerful, all-glorious, perfectly holy, completely sovereign, in control, God. 
who's sitting on a throne. And I can realize, man, this life isn't about me. And suddenly, as I do that, joy begins to bubble up. And all the stuff that feels mundane and humdrum and boring and unexciting fades away. That's not even what I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about the God who made me. And I'm thinking about worshiping Him. My focus changes, you see. I realize that Christmas isn't even about me or Hallmark movies or hot chocolate or chestnuts roasting on an open fire, as fun as those things are. It's actually about Jesus. It's actually about Him and His glory and His goodness and what He did. And then I, oh, I can lift my head up from the mundane tasks and the mundane day I'm having in worship. And so now, as I chip away at my to-do list or my grocery shopping or shoveling snow or whatever it is that I'm doing, then I can worship and I can see that there's a bigger story being told Suddenly, the sink full of dirty dishes can become an altar for worship. A laundry basket can become an altar for worship. A desk can become an altar for worship. So can anything good come out of your mundane days? Oh yeah. The best, the best days. If you turn your gaze to Him and you worship Him and you realize that life is not about me. The second truth that will help us to be filled with joy in the middle of the mundane is that life is a test. Life is a test. This is all through Scripture. All through Scripture. Psalm 7, 9 says, May you establish the righteous you who test the minds and hearts, O righteous God. He tests the minds and hearts. First Peter 3, 6-7 through says, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. God tests our faith to purify it, to make it stronger, so that at the coming of Jesus Christ, it may result in praise and glory and honor. Psalm 66.10 says, For you, O God, have tested us. You have tried us as silver is tried. You see, life on this earth is very, very short in light of eternity. Very short. It is a blip. And God tests us now in this short time so that we can be prepared, so that, we can, so that our faith can be pure and strong in the coming days. James 1.3 says, For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. So, what does that have to do with having joy in the mundane? Well, everything. Because when you remember that life is a test, all of life is a test, it reveals great purpose and great potential in every single day. When you realize that life is a test, then every day is an opportunity for you to exercise your faith and grow closer to God. Your routine days are not meaningless. They are a part of the test of your faith. How is that, you ask? 1 Corinthians 10.31 says... So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Everything you do, you are supposed to do in a way that glorifies God. 
And if it's something that you cannot do in a way that glorifies Him, then you shouldn't do it. But if it's something that you can glorify Him doing, then you're to do it to His glory. You can eat to His glory. You can shovel snow to His glory. You can clean the house to His glory. And so it's all a test. Colossians 3.23 says, Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Whatever you do. And so the test of my faith comes down to whether or not I can do whatever it is I'm doing joyfully as an offering to the Lord. Isn't that cool? So now, all of a sudden, I can, I can actually do the most mundane thing, whatever it is that feels just so mundane, so routine, so repetitive to you. For me, it's washing the dishes because we don't have a dishwasher. And I feel like the second that we finish washing dishes, when you've got four kids, um, it's like the second you finish washing dishes, the sink's full again. And it drives me nuts. But I was trying to remind myself of this truth this week, is that I can do that as an offering to the Lord. I can do that as worship. I can actually enjoy Him. I can enjoy His presence while I wash the dishes. It takes us having a heart that is focused on the Lord and a heart that is focused on the gospel. What is the gospel? The gospel is the good news that Jesus made a way for sinners like me, rebels like me, to be made right with God. You know, the Bible says we're all rebellious. We're all sinners. We all have chosen our own way, gone our own way. We don't want God to tell us what to do. We want to be our own God. We want to be autonomous. That's our nature. And that nature, that nature is called sin. It's in opposition to God and His holiness. And so God made a way through Jesus Christ. This is what we're celebrating. That Jesus Christ, when He came to earth, was God saying, I am providing for you a way so that your sins can be wiped away, they can be forgiven, and you can have a relationship with me. Well, getting through those mundane days, the test is that my heart stay focused on this truth, believing this truth, rooted in this truth, that God forgives me and loves me and wants a relationship with me. And this is a side note, but this is why studying the Bible daily is so important. Reading the Bible daily is so important because you need spiritual food. This is like this is like food to your soul. And so when you when you feed on God's word every day, you're nourishing your soul. You are strengthening your faith, your ability to stay rooted in the truth of the gospel. And to stay focused on him. So no days are throwaway days. No days are meaningless when you realize that life is a test. Every day instead is an opportunity for you to grow in your faith and to grow closer to the God who loves you. Number three, life is a gift. Life is a gift. James 4, 13 through 15 says, come now you who say today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. If the Lord wills. First Timothy 6.13 says, I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things. The fact that you and I are alive today is 100% by the express will of God. You are breathing right now. That breath that you just took is a gift from God. The fact that your heart is beating in your chest is a gift from God. 
Your life every day is a gift. Remember what we read earlier in Psalm 139, verse 16, it said, In your book were written every one of them the days that were formed for me, when as yet there were none of them. Every one of the days of your life is a gift from God. That's right, even your humdrum days at work, right? your mundane days, your weeks that feel like they're dragging on and on, those are a gift from God. We talked about this a few weeks ago. I love the verse, Psalm 118, 24. It says, This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. The one we're in today is the day the Lord has given me. That's His gift to me. And it says, Let us rejoice and be glad in it. If if we would accept this truth that, that our days are a gift from God, our life is a gift from God, it would radically change our perspective. Uh, some of you are surrounded by some really negative people who constantly pull you down. And it may be that you need to have a talk with them, or it might be that you need to remove yourself from some of those relationships. Some people are going to be so negative in your life, they're going to seek to pull you down with them. And, and here's what Scripture says. Scripture says in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, Give thanks in all circumstances. All circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Man. Imagine if we just recognize that the circumstances that I'm in are a temporary circumstance, a test, and my life is a gift from God. If this is a gift, if, if this day is a gift from God, then what should my response be? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to beat this into my kids' thick skulls right now. When, when, when they get a gift, we try and teach them. What are you saying? Thanks, thanks, thanks. No, 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 no. Look at the person that gave you the gift. What do you say? Thank you. You know, it's like, okay, that was really heartfelt. Thanks. Um, but, but, but we're like that. We're like my kids when it comes to all the gifts that God has given us. If you can enjoy a cup of coffee, what a gift. If you... Think about how miraculous this life is. Every single night, you go unconscious for like seven or eight hours. And while you're doing that, your body is being recharged. It's still, your heart's still beating and you're still breathing. You're still digesting food. Your brain is at work filing away memories that are important, erasing things that are not needed. Did you know that? You wake up the next day with so much that happened in your body and in your brain. And, and every single day, we have mornings, these new beginnings every 24 hours. You ever thought about that? We get a fresh start every 24 hours. God designed that. He made that. So what if we started looking around at all that we have to be thankful for? If we're driving down the road, we say, Lord, thank you for cars that, I, that we can move from place to place so quickly. And for stoplights that keep all this traffic organized. If you've ever been in India or anywhere like it, you will thank God for the systems that we have here on our road. Or, thank you for the steam that comes up from my hot chocolate or my coffee and the way that the light catches it. And thank you for the sun and the warmth that comes from the sun and, and for seasons that they change throughout the year. I mean, if you just think about it, there's so much to be thankful for if we stop and look around. 
And you say, but you don't know my, you don't know my spouse. It says, be thankful in all circumstances. And you say, you, you don't know my job. Be thankful in all circumstances. Yeah, but you don't, you don't know about the week that I've been having. Be thankful in all circumstances. Yeah, but you don't know about my finances right now. Be thankful in all circumstances. In all circumstances, we have the option of stopping and saying, Thank you, God. Thank you that I am alive, that I have breath in my lungs. Thank you that you've given me another day. Oh, why is it that we should thank him? Psalm 106 says, Praise the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. So guess what? Even when it feels like this isn't true or that you can't thank him, here's what, here's what we need to do. We need to stand on the truth and say, no, 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 no. He is good. Right in the middle of this situation at work, right in the middle of this mess in my family, right in the middle of this wayward child, right in the middle of this marriage that's struggling, right in the middle of my financial situation, He is good. His love endures forever. That's what's true. James 1.16 says, Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of life. Oh, some of us need a new perspective. This isn't to say that life isn't hard or that you pretend it's not hard. It's just to say that we change our posture from one of you know, a spoiled child to a grateful child. It says, oh God, you have blessed me with so much. Forgive me for not seeing it. Forgive me for not voicing it. And look, here's the thing. Scriptures again and again and again tell us to give thanks to Him. And so we can't use the excuse, oh God, you're omniscient, you know I'm thankful. That, that doesn't work. You know, my kids could say that. Hey, Mom, Dad, this Christmas, just so you know, we're thankful for everything. We'll just give you that in advance. No. I'm going to be like, every, every gift, I'm going to be like, stop. What do we say, you know? Because I want to teach them. Why? It's for their joy. It's not because I get some, it's not because I get something out of that. It's for their good. It's for their joy. And God is the same. He's not up there like, I can't believe you didn't tell me thank you. He's not mad about He's going, no, no, no. I want you to see. I want you to recognize the blessings in your life. It's for your good. It's for your joy. If we stop rushing through our days without noticing all the gifts, all the good and perfect gifts that come down from our Heavenly Father. If we stop and just say, thank you, God, it would change our mundane days, we would realize there are no mundane days, actually. There actually are no mundane days because God has given us the greatest gift, and that is He's given us forgiveness through Jesus Christ. And he's given us his spirit to come and dwell inside of us. And so if I have the Holy Spirit living inside of me, there's no such thing as a mundane day. There's no such thing. Every day is a gift. Life's not about me. And life is a test. If you remember those three things, you're going to be much more prepared for the regular, the routine, the monotony of everyday life. And you can have joy through it all. But this Christmas, in order for you to have real and genuine joy, I want to encourage you to think about the greatest gift that God has ever given, and that's the gift of His Son. In Romans 6.23, it 
we read that the wages of sin is death. What we earn because of our sin is death. But, it says but, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, the payment that we earned for our rebellion against God is death, eternal separation from God. But He has given us, through Jesus Christ, the offer of eternal life. What is eternal life? John 17, 3 explains. And this is eternal life, Jesus said, that they know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Eternal life is a relationship with the Creator. That's what eternal life is. It's knowing God, having friendship with Him. How do we do that? If we're sinful and rebellious, and He's holy and perfect, how do we have a relationship with Him? Romans 10.9 says, it's through faith in Jesus Christ. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came to earth as a baby. But He grew up. He didn't stay a baby. He lived a perfect life. He never sinned against the Father. He fulfilled all of the law, all righteousness. Never once did He sin. And then He went to a cross in our place. He said, that, that penalty of death, the wages that you have earned, I'll take that. I'll take your penalty on myself. And he went to the cross and he died. And he took the punishment, the penalty for all of our rebellion, and he was buried. And on the third day he rose from the grave, offering life to all who would believe in him. That's why the Christmas story is so incredible. Because it was the beginning of that. Ephesians 2.8 says, it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. So God's gift to you and to me and to all the world is forgiveness and a restored relationship through His Son to all who believe. Right now we're going to move into a time of response to the Lord based on what we've heard. Um, and if you've never place your faith in Jesus. I just want to invite you to do that this morning. This is not something that you have to wait until you get your act together, until you get your life cleaned up. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. He doesn't say, get your life cleaned up, and then come to me. That's religion. This is different. This is grace. This is about a God who says, I know how rebellious you've been and I still want you. And that's why Jesus died. He, he will forgive you of all of your sin. And so I want to give you the opportunity right now to place your faith in Jesus. Um, let's bow and, and pray. Right now, just quietly in your heart, if you want to put your faith in Jesus and you want to follow Him, then you can just, right now, between you and God, you can say, God, I'm, I'm sorry for my sins, my disobedience against You. I recognize that You made me and that I have turned away and I've done life ignoring You. I've done it my own way. You can say, God, I, I, want to, I want to put my trust in Jesus. I want Him to be my new King. I want Him to be in charge of my life. And if you do that right now in your heart, then, and you mean it, Scripture says that you will be saved. That means that God is going to forgive your sins and you become a follower of Jesus, a Christian. God, we thank you this morning for each person that's here. We thank you for what you're speaking to us. 
the ways that you're challenging us. I pray, God, that we would be able to leave here today um, with joy in our hearts, that we would, we would remember that life is not about me, that this life is short and it's a test, and God, that it's a gift. And Father, I pray for anyone in this room this morning that put their trust in Jesus. I pray that you would be with them powerfully, protect them, God, and help them to start this journey of following you. In Jesus' name, amen.